and not asking questions. It would be good if you could wear masks. I think it would be better for everybody. So uh, if you've looked at the recommended reading for the course, you have an idea of what most of the topics will be. So the first few weeks, we'll have to have causal properties of general relativity. And the references were on the recommended readings. There's my article, which you can find it on the art. Uh, the title begins with light rays and so on. Singularities and all that. There's also a role for where the relevant part is chapters well, 8 to 11. The difference between the two is that if you want more mathematical detail, you should look at Wald's book. In my notes and also in my lectures, you'll find more informal explanations. So even before you started studying general relativity, you all had a basic idea about Ramanian geometry, at least intuitively, because you're all quite familiar with curved two-dimensional surfaces. A curved two-dimensional surface is a reasonable prototype for Ramanian geometry in a positive signature. Of course, in general relativity, we're interested in Lorentz signature. And there are a lot of basic things, like the definition of the affine connection of the Riemann tensor and so on, which are the same independent of the, the signature. And so you can learn basics of general relativity up to and including things like the Schwarzschild solution and its predictions for motion of the planets treating Lorentz signature purely by formal analogy with Ramanian signature. <clears throat> For example, that's the way I learned it myself from Weinberg's book, which is actually an excellent book on gravitation and cosmology. <clears throat> there are a couple seats in row two. What's new in the Lorentz signature? And doesn't have an analog in Lorentz in Euclidean signature is causality. Okay. And the most, uh, many of the most uh, fascinating and puzzling aspects of general relativity have to do with the implications of causality. So that will be our focus in the first few weeks, which means we'll study topics like the formation of black holes and some diaries. Then, uh, and coming along with this will be the Hawking area theorem. We'll learn what's the problem, at least in classical general relativity, or of the idea of a shortcut through the wormhole. And then we'll learn the, uh, for example, what causality, well, we'll discuss causality in the context of the ads cft correspondence. That's a big word which you won't all be familiar with. The bare minimum you need to know. I'll explain when we get to it. So anyway, our goal is to understand what's different about the red signature from Euclidean signature, where you can't just, which you can't just learn by formally using the Euclidean formulas for the affine connection and the curvature tensor and the covariant derivatives. So for the starting point, we're going to consider causal pads in Minkowski space. Well, what's a causal path? Well, a path in general is described by giving space-time coordinates x mu. Let's say we're in d dimensions. Well, 
with this kind of metric. And to give a path, we give the coordinates as a function of some parameter. But two paths that differ only by change of parameter are considered equivalents. A path is causal if its tangent vector is everywhere timeline or null. But we can all, if so, we can always orient the path to make it future directed. In other words, after possible replacing s by minus s, we can assume that dx mu ds is a future directed. So now we want to consider two points in Minkowski space, p and q. Let's say that p is for the future of q. And we're going to look at the space of all causal paths from q to p. Well, one obvious fact about a causal path is that it has to stay inside the future of q, which is a kind of light count. Well, a light count together with its interior. Sometimes the phrase light cone is used to mean the cone itself, but here we mean the cone together with its interior. And we have also the pass light cone of P. So the two cones intersect in what I'll call DP, DPQ, which is called a causal diamond. The intersection of the future of Q with the pass of P. So any causal path. So if gamma is a causal path from P to Q, then it's contained entirely inside DPQ. DPQ is, of course, compact. So causal paths from P to Q can't get out of a compact set. But our first non-trivial result is going to be that the space of causal paths is compact. Which means that if you have any sequence Any sequence has a convergent subsequence. This would be completely false without the assumption of causality. But to see that, let's, for example, consider the Minkowski space in two dimensions. I'll call it M11, one space, one time. Although we're really interested in the Lorentz signature metric. Uh, I'll post one for a second. Then I'll take P to be the point 1, 0, T equals 1, X equals 0. I'll take Q to be the origin. And then an example of the sequence of non puzzle paths from P to Q would be to like X, P, sine of pi and t. That's not in parametric form, which I assumed over here. To put it in parametric form, we would just say that t is equal to the parameter, and x is sine pi and t. Anyway, if I define gamma n to be this curve, you see it is a curve from q to p, but it wiggles n times. And the wiggles all have constant amplitude, and as n goes to infinity, it becomes wilder and wilder. So there's no reasonable sense in which such a sequence has a convergent subsequence mm -hmm. as a path from q to p. There's some fine structure in that statement that maybe will be a homework problem. Anyway, 
as passed from P to Q in a simple integral limit. But suppose we had causal paths. So these are definitely not causal paths. For, uh, these paths are mostly going in space-like directions, actually. When n becomes large, they're moving in almost at zero constant time, parallel to the x-axis. And even if I change the world of x in time, we have paths that they'd be zigzagging back and forth so they have space-like functions. So nothing like this is going to be a causal path, but how would you prove that a sequence of causal paths has a convergent subsequence? Well, here it's convenient to introduce a Euclidean metric. So even though we're really interested in the Lorentz signature problem, it's often convenient to consider an auxiliary Euclidean metric. Uh, I've picked one. I had to pick a Lorentz frame to do so. So this wasn't unique. If we made a Lorentz transformation to different coordinates, I would have then, I could have written the same formula, but it would have been a different metric on the same Minkowski space. So I've picked a non-natural Euclidean metric that nevertheless is convenient in making the argument. Now if we go back to our situation, where p was 1, 0, and q is 0, 1, oh, sorry, 0, 0. In two dimensions, the causal path is just a square. Causality means that the tangent vector to a path is at no more than a pi over 4 angle from the vertical. So you can see that the Euclidean length of the causal path I'll call this Euclidean length L, is in a narrow range between 1 and the square root of 2. For this particular choice of P and Q. The straight line has Euclidean length 1. And you can't make length longer than going this way and then going this way, which would give you an extra factor of the square root of 2. So the Euclidean length is bounded above and below. And that means that we can We can parameterize a causal path by a parameter S, which is a multiple of, of the Euclidean length. And we can normalize it to go from 0 to 1. So in the case of these geodesic, we would simply let S be the Euclidean length parameter. In the case of this one, S would be the square root of 2, or sorry, 1 over the square root of 2 times the length. But anyway, since the length is bounded above and below, uh, we can, in particular, it's always positive. We can do it as they do. At that point, we can completely forget causality because. That's enough to imply that such, um, consider our sequence, gamma 1, gamma 2, that we want to prove has a convergent subsequence. So we have, the, we have x and t, or functions of x, x n of s and t n of s. We should put t first. I'll try to do that. Well, by definition, what well, let me just call this x vector of this. By definition, x of 0 is 0, 0. And x of 1 is 1, 0. So even without taking a subsequence, we have convergence at those two values of s. Now, I'm going to make the argument that you might be familiar to all of you from whatever encounter you may have had with the fundamentals of calculus. So we look at as the point x, s equals a half. So x n and s equals a half is contained in this square, which is compact. So there has to be a subsequence of values of n such that x n of 1 half converges. So we replace the sequence xn of s, but 
where we have convergence at s equals 0 and 1 by a, new, by a subsequence which I call x and y of s, which has convergence at 0 and 1 half and 1. But then we do the same thing, uh, adding points, let's say, 1 quarter and 3 quarters. At s equals 1 quarter and 3 quarters, xn of s is again in this compact square. So again, we can extract a subsequence so that xn converges at both 1 quarter and 3 quarters. At the third step, we extract a subsequence that converges if s is an integer over 2 cubed. Can you see in the back, or am I right too small? Okay. Then we keep going, and that the kth sequence, or sorry, the rth sequence, we have convergence if s is of form k over 2 to the r. And then finally, we pass through the subsequence x and n. In other words, the so-called diagonal subsequence, x1, 1, x2, 2. May not put columns yet, because it's in the columns. X3, 3. So now, the nth element of this sequence has r equals n, so it converges if um, the denominator is 2 to the r. But that's true for all r, because except for finite many exceptions, these are all in the r. I draw the nth element of this final se diagonal sequence from the nth uh, row of this picture. So that means that we have conversions at all rational. We have convergence at k over 2 to the r for all po uh, positive integer k, or non negative integer k. So we have convergence at a dense set of points. But since we parameterize these curves by the Euclidean arc length, the uh, nothing wild can happen between those, that dense set of rational numbers. So actually, this sequence is convergent. So we've proved that a, unlike a while well, a completely generic set of sequence of curves would have, in general, would not have a convergent subsequence. Causality ensures the existence of a convergent subsequence. Now, you're going to gradually see that that's powerful and useful. It might not be immediately obvious, but I'm going to uh, first use it to draw a trivial corollary, uh, which is something you already have, but just to illustrate for you. If you have a causal path, It has an elapsed proper time. And that's a function on the space of causal paths. And since we learned that the space of causal paths, it has to be bounded above on the space of causal paths. Because if there were a sequence of causal paths where tau goes to infinity, such a sequence could not possibly have a convergent subsequence. <clears throat> Given that it's bounded above, now you look at any sequence of causal paths where tau approaches its upper bound, and a convergent subsequence of that is going to have to be a maximum of tau. So we learn that there exists a curve, a causal curve, of maximal tau. But I can demystify that. That's simply equal to the geodesic from Q to P. The condition for a curve to extremize the proper time is that it's a geodesic. And 
slightly non-trivial fact, but the true fact is that in Minkowski space, a time-like genesic always maximizes the proper time. Thus saving this kind of called the twin paradox. The one who stays at home, traveling on a genesic, uh, ends up older than the one who took a, a trip. Because the genesic maximizes the proper time. <coughs> so we're going we kind of in drawing this corollary from our compactness statements, we prove something we already knew, but eventually we'll use the same argument in curved space time to prove Hawking's theorem about the Big Bang. So that will be a more interesting application. <coughs> well, what do yes? Space of causal paths from PGQ is compact. Uh, I believe we use a CDRE and PGM metric, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I read one before, and he also does the same. Is there a way, um, the, all the proofs use that, or is there a way to go around? Uh, I don't personally know a proof without using an auxiliary Euclidean metric. Okay. Any other questions? First tau has to be down to the bottom. Because if there was a sequence where tau could go to infinity, it would clearly have no convergent subsequence. We yep. proved compactness. Now that you know the tau is bound to the bottom, consider the sequence that converges. Now, now we want to show that the maximum is actually achieved. Right. It's bounded above, so there's a least up or bound. Is there a curve that has that least up or bound? Well, consider a subsequence whose, since it is the least up or bound, that means there's a subsequence whose proper times are converging to that value. That sequence will have a convergent subsequence, and the limit will be the curve that actually has the least up or bound as its proper time. I'd like to say that, um, well, the, this argument is definitely, well, it's in Wolf's book as well, but you'll certainly find my version of it in my lecture notes. And the same goes for most of the arguments I'll be explaining, many of which are explained in more detail in the written version than I can really present in the lecture. If you look carefully at some footnotes in the lecture notes, by the lecture notes, I mean the article, <coughs> light racing diagrams and all that, you'll see that there's some fine construction that I'm sparing you. It would be too tricky. There are a few details that would be too tricky to explain in the lecture. Any other questions? Now, okay, we look, okay, this, this was Minkowski space, but in what class of space times could we have made a similar mistake? Well, the only fact we use. Really was that DPQ equals the past of P intersected with the future of Q is compact. By past and future, I mean points that can be reached by causal paths, either null or timely. Sometimes one distinguishes the time-like future from the causal future. Here I mean the causal future. So we use the fact that the causal diamond was compact. That was the only important fact in the open. So a similar result is going to hold in any space time where causal diamonds are compact. But what kind of space time do those? So <coughs> So I first want to give a couple of examples of space times where causal diamonds are not compact. And then we'll introduce a useful condition that ensures that they are compact. So one example is going to be slightly artificial, and the second one um, it is a more natural example. So for the slightly artificial example, 
I didn't quite write down the definition of the space-time. I was intending to at the beginning, but I forgot. Space-time is a Lorentz signature manifold. Smooth manifold. So now I'm going to give a simple example, an almost trivial example, of a space-time where the causal dynamics aren't compact. Take Minkowski space. It could be in any dimension, but I'll take two dimensions so I can draw a picture and remove a point. So here's P, here's Q, and now I remove a point, R. It's hard to draw removing a point. I've drawn a little circle. It's meant to not look like a dot, it's meant to look like a little hole. But I tried to draw it big enough that the people in the back can see that it's a little hole. And this is a space-time, because removing a point does not affect the fact that we have a Lorentz signature manifold. But clearly, the causal diamond is no longer compact. And cle equally clearly, it's no longer true that a sequence of causal paths will have a limit. Because we could consider a sequence of causal paths from P to Q that in Minkowski space would have had a limit that passes through the point R. But in this space time, it has no limit. <coughs> so this is an example showing that if the causal diamond is not compact, in general, the space of causal paths is also not compact. Now, you may feel I've cheated with this example because it seems highly artificial. I can make it seem more natural as far as let phi be a function on the Kowski space that flows up at R. <coughs> and consider the vial rescale metric, not minus dt squared plus dx squared, but minus dt squared times dx squared times e to the phi. That's called a vial rescaled version, multiplying the metric by a positive function. It's called a vial rescaling of the metric. A vial rescaling does not affect the condition for the path to be causal. So as long as the function phi is a smooth function, the space of causal paths is the same as it was before, and it's still compact. However, suppose that the function phi blows up at the point R. Then we have to remove the point R, or we would not satisfy our definition of a space-time, which is hard to have a smooth, or a smooth manifold with a smooth or insignature metric. So for this space time, there's a rationale for moving the point R. And since, uh, so therefore this space time is a relatively natural example of a uh, space time where the causal diamond and the space of causal paths is not compact. Any questions on that example? Uh, the second, oh, OK, so, so uh, what about the corollary we drew from compactness, which is that there's always a path of um, greatest proper time from Q to P? That also, that will actually be true generically, but not always, because if R, if the point R that we removed happens to be on the geodesic, well, uh, I have to be more careful, because in general this will change the geodesics. You could arrange so that phi has a symmetry ex exchanging the two sides of the picture. If phi has a left-right symmetry, then if it doesn't blow up, the straight line from P to Q to P will still be a geodesic. But if it does blow up, the point you've removed is trying to be on the geodesic from Q to P. And there will be no path of greatest proper time from Q to P. In fact, because of the blow what will happen is that because of the blow up, paths that go nearby R can have very long proper time. And for suitable function phi, there will be no upper bound on the proper time elapsed between Q and P. 
which certainly implies that there's no max path that maximizes the property. Okay, the second example, well, is one that uh, people are interested in quantum gravity study a lot in the anti disease space. But to keep things simple, I'm going to just, uh, what I'm saying, what I'll say is true in any dimension, but to write simple formulas and avoid any extraneous details and have nice pictures, I'll just do it in two dimensions. So anti de Sitter space is a solution of Einstein's equations with negative cosmological constant and maximum symmetry. But concretely, it's described by this metric. Sigma goes from zero to pi. So anti de Sitter space is a strip. Sigma equals zero is on the left boundary. Sigma equals pi is on the right boundary. And time goes vertically. The boundaries that sigma equals zero and pi can't be included in the space time because the metric blows up there. And more fundamentally, because the distance diverges. If you go toward the boundary in the sigma direction by integrating the sigma with sine sigma from A down to epsilon, you'll see it diverges as epsilon goes to zero. So the boundaries are infinitely far away if you try to get there along a space like that. However, suppose you try to get to infinity the boundary of a light like that. Then the vial factor in front has no bearing. The metric is equivalent for light like paths to a strip in Minkowski space. So a light ray would just travel at pi over four angle to the vertical. And you can reach infinity and back in a finite time. This is something which is quite familiar to those of you in the audience who have worked on the so-called ADS CFT correspondence. <coughs> but anyway. Now continuing with this example, let Q well, let Q be that point, but in fact, although not manifest in the way I wrote the metric, this is a homogeneous space time, so Q could have been any point. In other words, for any point we could pick coordinates. Well, I didn't even tell you what its coordinates at this point. But maybe T equals zero. Equals pi over two. But whatever they were, it doesn't matter because it's a homogeneous space time. Now you can ask for different choices of P, but is the causal diamond compact? And you'll see that if P is slightly to the future of Q, well, for that choice of P, the causal diamond is that rectangle and it's certainly compact. And in fact, a little thought will show you that as long as P is in the interior of the square, the causal diamond is compact. I could put P up here. Well, let's call this one P1. For P2, I have the bigger rectangle. But as soon as P is outside that square, let's say P3, the causal diamond DQP3 is not compact. Because a causal path from Q can get as close as it wants to the boundary before going to P3. Remember, the boundary points are not part of the space time. They can't be, because the metric blew up there, and those points are infinitely far away. With our definition that the space time is a smooth, room, smooth manifold with a smooth Lorentz signature metric, we can't include the boundary points. But in the picture, we include them. It's convenient to include them, but they're not. It's convenient to include them in the picture and in many mathematical arguments, but they're not points in the space time. So, 
the causal path can come arbitrarily close to the boundary in this picture, and that means that the space of causal paths can't be compact. A sequence of causal paths that's getting closer and closer to the boundary won't have any convergent subsequence. Or just more brutally, what the causal line is, well, it's the interior of this five-sided picture, except that one boundary is missing. So it's got four closed boundaries and one missing boundary. Now, what's the maximum elapsed proper time on the causal path from Q to P3? There is none. What's that? There is none. Well, there's no upper bound. Because if you travel very close to the bound, it's similar to this example we had before, where for suitable functions following a path that goes very close to R in the picture can have arbitrarily big proper time. Likewise, here, if you go sufficiently close to the boundary and stay there for a while, you have a very large proper time, and there's no upper bound on how big that proper time can be. So there's no um, upper bound on the proper time elapsed from on a causal path from Q to P3. In particular, there's no geodesic that maximizes the proper time. In fact, the stronger statement is that there's no geodesic at all from Q to P3. That's not obvious from what I've told you. I think we won't really use it. I'm not planning to prove it. You can find it explained in an appendix in my lecture notes. So these are uh, a slightly artificial and a more natural example uh, where the spaces of causal paths fail to be compact and there isn't any upper bounds on the possible elapsed proper time of a causal path. And as you're going to see, it's important to know about such compactness and uh, such an upper bound. So we're going to be interested in criteria under which things are well made. So what we're going to navigate toward next is a discussion of a general condition that will lead to good behavior. So first of all, we have the following local facts about the Minkowski space. Which is the, <coughs> oh, sorry, about general relativity. I should, or if you like, a local fact about Ramanian geometry. Here we're going to be, for a moment, back in the realm of statements which are equally true in Euclidean signature or in Lorentz signature. Well, I'll save it for Lorentz signature. But with a couple changes of words, the same thing is true in Euclidean signature. So each point has a Q, was it? Has a small neighbor U, Q. That is well approximated by Minkowski space. By sorry, a neighborhood in Minkowski space. So there are different aspects to being well approximated. But one useful statement is that each point Q has a small neighborhood with the property it's called geodesically convex. If you're given any two points in that neighborhood, there's a unique geodesic between them that's contained in the neighborhood. So that's it. If we're in the Minkowski space, causal diamond has that property, for example. Given any two points in a causal diamond, well, first of all, any two points in the Minkowski space are connected by a unique geodesic anyway. But if you have two points in a causal diamond, the geodesic between them is contained in that diamond. The diamond is convex. So, in general relativity, given any point 
It has a small neighborhood that's well approximated in any reasonable sense by an Minkowski space. The metric is almost flat and can be approximated by a piece of the Minkowski space metric. And also, there's this geodesic property that any, in a suit, every point has a sufficiently small neighborhood that two points in that neighborhood are connected by a unique geodesic in that neighborhood. So, and we're going to call this a local Minkowski neighborhood. Every two points are connected by a unique genesic, but it might use time like space like a null. And same here. This statement held for any two points, regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's something we'd like to be true that isn't <coughs> true without imposing a further condition on space time. Let Q be a point. So M, I think I'll use as a generic name for space time. And P slightly to the future of Q. You can take that to mean that there's a geodesic from Q to P that's time-like with small proper time. Here's a question. This is a tricky, this is a kind of trick question. Well, is DPQ compact? So, one's intuitive feeling of what space time should be would tell us that if P is slightly to the future of Q, DP here should always be compact. But it was in the two examples I gave you. For example, in this one, we removed a point, but a point slightly to the future of Q has a nice compact causal alignment. And also, that was also true in the anti sitter example. So you might hope it's true in general, but it's not true without a causality condition. So here we need a causality condition. And um, you see, the most, this is, what makes this obvious is that we at least need the condition of there are no closed causal curves. From Q to Q. Because if we have a closed causal curve from Q to Q, supposed to consist of these points in the small region between P and Q. That was the picture I drew. But if there is a closed causal curve from Q to Q, in general we know nothing about where it goes. It might go to a region of space-time where a point was missing or where there was an anti-sitter boundary or where anything bad could happen. So if there's a closed causal curve from Q to Q, any point on that curve is in the future of Q and also in the past of P. Because you can make a causal curve from Q to P that first goes around the and then goes on to P. 
So we at least need to have no closed causal curves in space time if we want it to be true that DPQ, well, we, this shows that we need, that's not universally true. We need some condition on space time to make it true that DPQ is, DQP is compact if P is slightly to the future of Q. So to get a nice statement, we need no closed causal curves. But um, we need a slightly stronger condition, which is called strong causality. Strong causality says that not only there are no closed causal curves from Q to itself, but there are no causal curves that come arbitrarily close to, to returning to Q. Because if you could have causal curves that come arbitrarily close to returning to Q, so you, you go through such a curve, then go on to P. Again, you'd explore a region of space time that you know nothing about. So um, you wouldn't be in the situation where DQP is contained in a local Minkowski neighborhood. So um, it's reasonable to consider space times like this to be pathological. But we do need to exclude them. So, a statement that's simpler than um, what I wrote in my lecture notes, but kind of in hindsight I wish I'd been in, is uh, in my lecture notes and also in Bold's book, you can read the definition of strong causality, explained more carefully than I have. But the purpose is to ensure that if P is slightly to the future of Q, And I remind you that means if P is close enough to Q along a time like geodesic, then DPQ is contained in a local Minkowski network. So that's going to be false in general if we have closed time like curves, because such a closed time like curve will consist of points to the future of Q and the past of P and then we won't have any control on where it goes. So this is a nice condition on a space time. I feel in hindsight that I, I kind of wish I had taken this as the definition of strong causality. When I wrote those lecture notes, I really wanted to get rid of technicalities. And this is one point where I got tangled up and I was really not happy with what I wrote. And after thinking about it for a couple more years. <laughs> <laughs> I think that instead of proving that this follows from strong causality, which is not fun, I should have just taken this as the definition of strong causality. <laughs> okay, but anyway, if P is slightly to the future of Q, then we we, in a reasonable space time, DPQ is compact, and therefore the space of causal curves is compact. Because we've understood that the space of causal curves will be compact, um, whatever DPQ is compact. Whatever the causal diamond is compact. But we want to say something when P isn't slightly, just slightly to the future of Q. And that will be presumably the rest of this lecture, and probably a good part of the rest of it. What if P is not just slightly to the future? So we're now going to discuss our causality condition that's much stronger than the absence of closed time-like curves. It's also much stronger than the than strong causality, regardless of which definition of strong causality you take. And it's the um, most important causality condition in general relativity. And this is the condition for space time to be globally hyperbolic.
So the intuitive idea is that a globally hyperbolic space-time is one in which everything can be predicted based on initial data on some initial value surface S. So here's space-time. S is a space-like surface. Sometimes it's useful to let S have null portions, but for our lectures, S will be space-like. And we want to condition on S such that everything that happens in space-time is knowable from conditions on S. So, well, so one definition is that one part of the definition is that S is space-like. Every, another point is that every point in non S is to the past or future of S, but not both. So that means so every point in space time can reach from S by a causal curve of some kind. And that will either be a future going causal curve from S to P, or to a point, or a future going causal curve from the point to S. But that point. If we assume that the condition that no point is both to the past and to the future of S is similar to saying that there are no closed time-like curves. <coughs> but the third condition is the key one. We need an additional condition which will ensure that every signal that you see anywhere in the space-time can be computed from a knowledge of what there was on S. So if you're sitting at a point P and get the signal, where did it come from? Well, it presumably got to you along a causal path. That's what it's supposed to do with general relativity. So you'd like to know that each causal path can be continued backwards until it came from S. So let's say if P is to the future of S, to predict physics at P based on what there was on S, what you need to know is that every causal path that arises at P can be continued backwards until it reaches S. Well, let me give an example where this condition is not satisfied, and that might make it more obvious. Suppose I take a globally hyperbolic space time like Minkowski space. Minkowski space. Well, we'll check in a moment that Minkowski space is globally hyperbolic. Take a space time where it's true that every um, <coughs> causal path can be continued back until it reaches S and remove a point. As before, you can make removing a point less unnatural by making a violent scaling to a metric such that that point couldn't be included. Then you'll see that there could be a causal path that originated at R and can't be continued until it reaches S. It gets stuck at the point R. If that happens, you cannot predict physics at P based only on a knowledge of initial data on S. There could be a signal that originated at R. So if you want to be able to predict the physics of P based only on initial data on S, what you need to know is that Every causal curve can be continued until it reaches S. That's the third and possibly technical sounding statement of the definition of global hypervelocity. But it's, since a signal could have arrived at you on any causal path, a signal that can't, couldn't be continued until it reaches S can convey to you a signal that doesn't know what there was on S, or can't be determined from what there was on S. So that's the motivation behind this condition. Uh, any questions about the definition?
So for example, let's check that Minkowski space is globally hyperbolic by this definition. We can take S to be, for example, the hypersurface T equals zero. So first of all, every point in Minkowski space that isn't at T equals zero is either positive or negative T, so it's to the past or future of S. Secondly, every causal path, let's say back, as far as you start at the future of S, for example, positive T, a backwards going causal path is moving backwards in time at a rate, well, it's moving backwards in time, and it can always be continued until it reaches time zero. You can always keep going farther backwards in time until you reach time zero. Likewise, if you start in the past, any causal path can be continued to the future until it reaches time zero. So Minkowski space, if you like, is the prototype of the global hyperbolic space. Okay. So um, if we take this example where we this example here is meant to be, here I took a wiggly surface. Obviously in Minkowski space, Time zero was good, but any wiggly surface that wasn't too different from time zero would have been equally good. However, if you make the, so we have a globally hyperbolic space time and remove a point, we get to a situation where from day to and S, we can't predict everything throughout the space time. We can't predict data that's to the future of the point we made. But the rest of the space-time, as a topology given any S, keeping if, take any space like that for S and take points slightly to the future. By our strong causality assumption, things are well behaved. Backwards going causal paths that don't go very far are contained in a local Minkowski neighborhood. So if we just include the point slightly to the future of cast of S, we get a globally hyperbolic space. Right? In this example, if we throw away everything to the future of the missing point, the rest of the space time is globally hyperbolic. So What's called the domain of dependence of S is the subspace of, of M, which is the largest globally hyperbolic one. It consists of all points with the property. So if, 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 if S is not an initialized surface of a globally hyperbolic spacetime, there will still be points with the property that any causal path from that, going backwards from that point reaches M. Or if you start in the past, the other one going to the future reaches M. The set of all such points is called the domain of dependence. And the boundary of any prime is the better than M prime, I'll call it curly dependence, the domain of dependence has. Its boundary is the Cauchy horizon. I have a quick question. Well, I, 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 I should have said here that such an S is a Cauchy horizon. Well, I'll, I'll use a synonym for phrases Cauchy hypersurface and initial value surface. Yes? Is condition 2 equivalent to strong causality? Or can it be replaced by strong causality? In other words, suppose, suppose you have a space-like surface, yes. but condition 2 is not satisfied. Yes. So 
then um, presumably something bad will be close to the third of the Saturday. Definitely something bad. What I mean is, no. can you do the same construction of the No, no, no it's, not, it's not going to work. Well, without further discussion, it's not going to work to strong um, For example, take our end signature cylinder. The metric is just minus pt squared plus dx squared. But x is equivalent to x plus 1. It's an excellent space time. It obeys every reasonable causality condition. It's globally hyperbolic if you pick this S. But now suppose we pick an S that wraps around. Um, the condition it doesn't satisfy is that every point is there. Now a point is both to the past and the future of S. So, um, this part of the condition was not just a condition on the space time, it's a condition on S. Any other questions? Give another example of a, of a, so, push, a domain of dependence in a Cauchy hypersurface. So, just to make it easier to draw, we'll do two dimensional Minkowski space. And this kind of surface is a Cauchy hypersurface. But now take this kind of surface, a hyperboloid. It's not a Cauchy hypersurface because a causal path, here's an example of a causal path that that would just S. A causal path could be asymptotically parallel to this vertical, so to this diagonal line, and it never reaches S. So such an S is not a causal, not a Cauchy hypersurface. And you can ask what's its domain of dependence. It's not hard to see that the domain of dependence is the future light kind of the origin. Every point to the future of the origin has the property that the causal path through that point can be extended even toward the future of the past until it reaches us. And the Cauchy horizon of us is the light cone itself as opposed to its interior. So D of S is the future light cone of the origin plus interior. And the Cauchy horizon is the future light cone. So if you're given initial data on S, you can predict a solution of, for example, Maxwell's equations throughout the future light cone of the origin, but you can't predict what there is outside that. Well, any more questions on this before we go? The answer to that question is that in, I shouldn't be asked if the people in the back can hear as well as see. Okay. In a globally hyperbolic space time,
spaces of causal curves are compact. This is what I want to explain next, although I don't think we'll finish it today, actually. When I, uh, there are two versions of this statement. One is that the space of causal curves from Q to P is come out. Well, when I make this statement, we consider the empty set to be compact. If Q isn't to the future of P, if P isn't to the future of Q, there might be no causal paths from Q, future no causal paths from Q to P. So this set might be empty. We won't treat that as an exception. The statement is that for any two points, the space of causal curves from between those two points in a globally hyperbolic space time is compact, possibly empty. It might consist of only one point, but it's always compact. There's a Related statement, instead of a causal path between two points, you can consider a causal path from a given point to a Cauchy hypersurface S. So I'll write CQS for the paths from Q to S. And likewise, CSQ for the paths the other way around. I always put the I, can, I consider as a convention future going causal paths. And they're future going from the one at the bottom to the one at the top. So here I'm considering either paths between two given points or paths between a given point and a given Cauchy hypersurface. So in a globally hyperbolic space time, the claim is that these are all compact. And as I say, explaining that is going to be the next goal. After which we'll start looking at a boy that's useful to know. So, in Wald's book, and before that in Hawking and Alice, there's a proof of this that uses Zorn's sum. I really didn't like it because <laughs> how many say it like this shouldn't depend on exotic statements in set theory. And I really spent a lot of time unsuccessfully trying to find a proof that didn't use Zorn's on it. But finally, although I feel it, I found one in the math book by Ehrlich and others. You'll find the reference in Appendix D of my lecture notes. And what I finally wrote, which you can find in the appendix, is the Zorn-based proof of Hawking, Ellis, and others. But I also explained the, the non-Zorn proof of Ehrlich and others. And I decided for you we're going to do the non-Zorn proof because I was happier with it. And it does require explaining a preliminary, which offers a preliminary we'll also need to know later. So, The preliminary that we need to know is that any manifold M I'm putting any in quotes because if you're too abstract about manifolds, you can have extremely wild topology. I don't want to formalize what exactly we mean by a manifold to keep it from being too well. But any manifold M has a complete Euclidean metric. We're going to use that as a lemma from which we'll rather, in a surprisingly simple way, deduce the fact that spaces of causal curves are compact in globally hyperbolic Lorentz signature space times. How do we know that any n has a complete Lorentz signature metric? Well, first of all, here's the n. Well, first we should know that it has, any m has some metric. Any m has some metric because metrics can be added. By definition, any M is equivalent to an open set in, sorry, any M is locally equivalent to an open set in some Euclidean space. So we take the 
recover n by open set, so in each open set, take a sum metric that's not zero in that open set, and then just brutally add them all up. So, any, so the first step is that any n has sum metric. Well, um, at that level, we might have picked a metric that wasn't complete. Well, so what does complete mean? Complete Romanian metric means that every genesic can be extended to have infinite length in both directions. So for example, Rn is complete. A genesic is a straight line. It has an infinite length in both directions. So what we're going to be studying, in effect, following Penrose and Milken, is how completeness fails in Lorentz signature geometry. But for orientation, we should be familiar with what completeness means. So I think I was erring and skipping over the definition of completeness. Completeness, for Riemannian metrics, completeness means that the geodesic can be extended to have infinite length in both directions. By some definitions, you can take a piece of the geodesic and call it a geodesic. But if you've done that, you could have extended the geodesic to its maximum possible length, and that length is infinite in both directions. Now, so any n has some metric h. And then the second step is that there is some function phi. such that g equals e to the phi times h is complete. Well, how would you make that happen? Well, roughly speaking, you want phi to blow up your infinity on it. So you want to have a measure of how far you are from the boundary of n. And then phi should be 1 over that distance. So how would you measure how far you are, on a completely general Riemannian manifold, how would you measure how far you are from infinity? Well, you take a point P, and you take the shortest geodesic that can't be extended further. If n was already complete, the distance of every geodesic, every geodesic can be extended up to infinite length. So this function would be infinite. What about the green circle on the sphere? Do you just keep on going? Yes. Okay. You're allowed to say lot to you. Right. To clarify the question for everybody, a geodesic is not required to be embedded in space in M. As in the example of a great circle on a sphere, it goes around. But it can be continued to infinite length in both directions. It's retracing its steps, but that's allowed. A geodesic a geodesic is a solution to the geodesic equation. Luckily, it's a very good in the manual of the geodesic equation. And it continues to infinite length in both directions. So if n is complete, then for every point p, uh, every geodesic can be extended to infinity in both directions. But if n is not complete, there will be some p's which have some distance from the boundary, meaning that there's a shortest inextendable GSE from, from P. So I'll call it length D. So D is either a positive real number or infinity. And then we just uh, think we just uh, find the E to the of the beta max and H. And since it blows up near the boundary, we've achieved the situation where the metric is now complete. So uh, you can find this argument explained a little bit more precisely in an appendix of more lecture notes. Any questions about that? So now there's a now there's a compactness statement for 
in extendable curves in any complete Riemannian metric. But gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on. Could get any sequence of in extendable curves. That's all start at the same point P. So here's gamma 1. Here's gamma 2. Here's gamma 3 and so on. Gamma 4 must be this. Uh, as a nameless comment, one of the gammas might be around without ever going to infinity. Some of them go to infinity, some don't. The gammas are any, if, any sequence of any sensible curves from the game. They all have an infinite length. They all have an infinite length in the Euclidean metric. Because in a complete Riemannian manifold, a curve of finite length, and somewhere inside the manifold, it can be continued further. The claim is that any such sequence has a convergent subsequence. <clears throat> How do we prove that? Well, so let D and B, the set of points in N, of distance equal to a less than time from P. In a complete Ramanian manifold that's going to be compact, because if a, if a point has a distance, a point will have a minimum distance from P, that will be its distance along a shortest geodesic. What are the points that can be reached along a geodesic of length that goes down? Well, you, get to, you start at P, you get to pick a direction. The space of directions is compact. Then you travel at most of distance and along a geodesic that's also compact. So the set of points you can reach by a geodesic of length that goes down is compact. a distance no bigger than n from p, meaning it can be reached by p from some curve of length no more than n, then there will be a geodesic connected that point to p that's only shorter, if anything. So the shortest geodesic connected the point in bn to p always has a length that goes down. So bn is compact. So if we have our sequence, of these points, got curves, gamma 1, gamma 2, which are all curves from P, restrict them to the end. Well, restrict them to be one first. Let me say this a little bit differently. So we parameterize gamma i by arc length s. And it goes from 0 to infinity because, as I remarked, an inextensible curve is going to have an infinite length in a complete Ramanian manifold. So, first, restrict to S equal to less than 1. That means the restriction is now contained in B1. And B1 is compact. And now we're in a situation we were in about an hour ago. We have a sequence of curves with the same starting point in the compact manifold. So by the same logic I told you before, 
there's a subsequence. Gamma 1, 1. Gamma 2, 1. Gamma 3, 1. That converges for s equal to less than 1. But then we can do it again. Now we restrict to s equal to less than 2. And so there will be a further subsequence, gamma 1, 2, gamma 2, 2, gamma 3, 2, that converges for s equal to less than 2. At the nth step, one sequence, gamma 1 and gamma 2 and gamma 3 and that converges for s equal to less than n. And then the last step is the same as it was before. We look at the diagonal sequence. Gamma n, it converges to all us. Because it's a subsequence of the sequence of gamma 1 ends for every n. Or it is more precisely, except for a finite number of exceptions at the beginning. Yes? How is it being guaranteed that as you increase the size of the ball, that the specific uh, limit of the curves that we are choosing doesn't change? For example, ball of size 1, maybe if this curve. Mm -hmm. Here we have a sub subsequence of the original sequence. Yes. This is defined as a subsequence of this sequence. Ah, I see. This is I a see. subsequence yeah, yeah. of this sequence. I understand. So, at the nth step, we have a short convergence inside the bowl of radius n. Yeah. Or whatever, sorry, for the, up to length n of the curves. Here, which is weaker than inside the bowl of radius n, in general, because the curves might not be expeditious to go and follow it. At the nth step, we have convergence up to s equals n. And we're always picking a subsequence of what we had before. So we have convergence up to infinity. So we've learned, and I will stop here except for questions, that A, every space time has a complete Riemannian metric. And okay, we've, we've learned that in every manifold, every sequence of inextendable curves with a fixed starting point has a convergent subsequence. There is no mention of causality. Uh, we will go back at the beginning of the next lecture to the Lorentz signature context and deduce compactness of causal spaces of causal curves in a Lorentz signature space time. But we'll stop here except if there's a quick question. Yes? I have a quick question about the proof that every Eugenian manifold, sorry, every manifold has to be Yes. Um, we seem to be worried about the case where there is a boundary constructed this way and then eliminating that issue. But even on a manifold without a boundary, couldn't you a priori imagine that there's some curve that First of all, the manifold didn't literally have a boundary. Okay. Because by definition, the manifold has a, every point has an input or isomorph into an open set in the Kelsey space. So when I use the phrase boundary, I'm speaking loosely. There were not boundary points in there. And there was a boundary. What's that? Is boundary or Well, the precise definition is that for point P, we define a function which was the length, the shortest length of a geodesic from P that can't be extended further. It's informal to say that that's the distance of P from the boundary from the precise definition is what I just said about the length of the shortest and extendable geodesic. So there weren't boundary points. Really. You can add them to draw pictures, but they're not part of the map. It's hard to draw a picture without drawing <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, the picture has to go off. <laughs> Locally is a subspace of Euclidean space, so it can certainly have a natural focus. 
And secondly, the Euclidean metrics can be either indiscriminately. The only condition on the Euclidean metric is that it's an n by n positive definite symmetric matrix. The sum of two has the same properties. That's not true in Lorentz symmetry. So in Lorentz symmetry, it would not be true that every manifold is symmetric. But Euclidean metrics can be added. So trivially, every manifold had a Euclidean metric. That was the first half of the argument. So we just got some metric h comes to a great data. Then we improved it to the five times h, which is a good metric, a good starting point. We didn't care very much what it was. It was not very natural. It was a complete metric, but otherwise we didn't have any interest in what it was. So we're not really interested in trying to pick it more specifically, since any complete metric was adequate for the argument. Any other questions? Okay, we'll call it later and see if